So, all right. So first off, thank you, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming today at, at Algolia. Um, maybe my first question: Can you guys raise your hands if you know what we do? Okay, there's still a lot of hands that are not <laughs> up there. So very, very quickly, what is uh, what is Algolia? So we're um, an API, so navigation and discovery API uh, that allows on any website, mobile application, an instant uh, content access and consumption experience. So um, it's a lot of words. Uh, if any of you have a free box at home and uh, you use search on the free box, it's actually our search engine that is behind that. Uh, so we're in a lot of the tools and services that you use every day. You don't know it, but, uh, but we're here. A um, few words by myself, and then it's going to be all about you. Um, uh, my name is Gaetan. I've joined you know, it is uh, interesting that the company has such a strong brand, <coughs> given that you're right. It, it's somewhat invisible in a lot of services, isn't yep. it? It is pr pretty impressive. Maybe we won't get into that today. But uh. um, So my name is Gaetan. I'm the VP of Revenue today. I joined the company four years ago. I was employee number uh, four, uh, the first one wearing the, the, the business hat. And, um, and, and we've grown today to 250 employees. Uh, so um, um, pretty uh, happy about that, that journey. Uh, that was made possible by amazing people, such as Jason. Uh, who's been a, a, a tremendous mentor for for a few years now, and that's why we uh, wanted to have him with us uh, with us tonight. Um, I'll say a few words about you, and then you'll correct me if I'm if I'm far wrong. Okay. Sure. So, uh, for me, the main the main thing when I first heard about you was uh, your success with uh, with EcoSign, uh, that you grew from zero to ten, then got acquired by Adobe, and then grew it from ten to a hundred million at Adobe. Is that, is that accurate? It's almost accurate, but we'll, we'll, we'll close enough. Yes. Yeah. Not all of that. The latter part was under my stewardship, but yes. All right. Uh, after that, and yeah. that's when we actually um, met you. You joined uh, Storm Ventures, right? Yes, I joined someone else's investment firm. And yes. uh, and that's when you made the investment in Algolia. Yes. After this, you moved. So as you were doing that, you started Saster. Um, amazing first off, it was an amazing conference in San Francisco. An amazing group of people around the SaaS topic. Um, and now you're actually, you've actually created the fund called Saster Fund. Correct? Yes, that is true. And that's where, what's that's what, that's what you're doing today. So maybe if you want to say a few words, more, a few more about that, and then we can. Uh, sure. Um, yes. So uh, I started uh, this community called Saster, which is, you know, somehow has has uh, not much structure on it, but somehow has become the largest community for sort of B two B and probably B to D to uh, founders and executives in the world. And um, it started off with a, as a blog after I sold my last company to Adobe, uh, uh, as Gaten mentioned. And then fast forward to, then we started to do like a couple meetups. And then we did one bigger event that, that you and Nicholas were at in 2015. The Sastra Annual last year had 10,000 people in San Francisco. And we had almost 1,600 in our first European event uh, this last Friday. And we'll probably have 14,000 in San Francisco this year. And, we're going to target 2,500 in Paris uh, 51 weeks from, from now, uh, next year. Um, and then, yeah, and then somewhat serendipitously, I, and I did raise a, another $90 million fund. I immediately put $4 million into Algolia. I would have put 10 if I was allowed to. Um, and lear learned a lot from that. We can talk about to, to folks that are founders or other here that kind of want to talk about the states of the market and what U.S. folks think. I think we're going to spend most of our time on revenue, but all the Saster contents about scaling revenue and the thorough learning from Saster, literally 3,000 pieces of content later, uh, 200 podcasts that Harry's done, four, 300 videos. The real learning is that, uh, which I wish I'd known as a CEO, um, is that at least for a given ACV, for a given price point, all these products scale the same. Like the sales, marketing, customer success, retention, all that stuff is kind of the same for a given price point, and you can almost abstract away product. And uh, if I'd known that, uh, I, I could have sought out better advice as a founder, and the whole point of Saster is to not talk too much about, even though I love product, I love engineering issues, ignore that, because they're all different, right? But, but I think fundamentally the way tools change, but the way teams built is the same, and that's what we can all learn, learn from each other. All right, thank you very much, Jason. So we have about an hour, a little over an hour. Uh, there's a bunch of questions that I've put on slides. Uh, the idea is to go over um, a lot of topics that actually we went through and that I thought was were quite critical during during the growth phase. 
uh, what I would love from you is to actually interrupt me as often as you can with questions. Uh, and for that, we have a mic that will pass around the, the room. Um, the first question, yes. right? Uh, I don't know if you saw it. Um, there's one thing it. we have, so actually, uh, that's, that's for you, Nico. So we have, we have two founders that are technical founders. Yes. Do um, you think it's a problem, or, or do you think, like in the companies that you've seen, um, or you invested in, uh, do you value like a CEO that is sales, like more sales oriented or not, or is it an issue, or like what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I've, I've, evolved, I've learned, I've learned over the last five years as I've had a chance to invest in 23 companies and seeing what happened. And, um, you know, I myself, actually when I was 13, I was probably making $5,000 a month with the software company, and that's when I peaked. So that was the end of me as a, as a, as a programmer um, and became a business guy. And my co-founders were always engineers, but I wasn't, I wasn't technical enough. Um, and I learned a lot from the strengths and weaknesses of that and the companies I invested in. And I, now I am, I do have a bit of a prejudice. Um, I will never invest in a sales guy CEO. And I, that guy has no gender attribution. Um, I do think it can work uh, if you surround yourself with great co-founders. But what's happened, uh, what's happened over the last 10 years in B2D and B2B is the bar has gone up. The products today, you know this, the products today are so much better than they were a couple years ago. They're, and they're, in, they're, they're two orders of magnitude better than, in, than, in, than when I started. When I look back at what I built at EchoSign and more successful founders at the same time as me, Aaron from Box and, a whole, and, and, and Kirk Repay from Aptis, and this group of us in 05 and 06, these products were terrible. I mean, Aaron jokes about it too. Box was a horrible product when it launched. I had, or, and now, the, now browsers were weak, but you can't get away with that today. The, the good news is the markets are a thousand times bigger than 10 years ago, and they're literally 10 times bigger than when Algolia started. The, these markets are 10 times bigger than just four years ago, but customers will only tolerate excellence, even from a five-person startup. And Algolia was special. It was... It was a very limited product when it launched. I mean, uh, I think it was very limited, but it was special, right? But it was, but for what it did, for a set of narrow use cases, it was magical, right? And that's the bar. So I'm not saying for folks here that are CEOs that don't have an engineering background, you can't be. But what I do say is I, I generally won't touch those. I've made exceptions. But make sure your co-founders are, are epically great. And most importantly, if you're early stage and you don't know what a great, uh, head of engineering and co-founder is, find out, like learn quickly because the bar is too high today. And I, I thought I knew, but I had the best uh, VP of engineering I ever met with that helped me recruit my initial team and help and help be a sanity check on all of our 10 additional engineers and made sure my CTO was really as good as I thought he was. And make sure, because today, Starting something as a hack that's crummy, it won't it won't scale. The bar the bar's too high. No. So, do you need with a sales background? No. Now the flip side. Let's the other thing is, the flip side is what we've all learned is the superpower. The best combination is a reasonably technical CEO that will that actually likes to sell, and that doesn't happen every day. Um, but if but 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 Nicholas got out there in the early days. You got out there with him. The team got out there. That's not always the case. Some folks want to magically sit in front of the, the iMac and have the customers come rolling in with the freemium product. So the perfect combination is someone that either that at least used to be a great engineer um, and actually will get on a plane um, or go meet with a customer. <laughs> then, then you have something that the rest of the world doesn't have. Nice. So and maybe before we move to the next questions, I would like to know more about you folks. Um, who's who's pre-revenue? Right. Pretty small. Who's, between, uh, who's below one million in, uh, in annual recurring? Okay. All right. Uh, between 28%. Between 1 and 10. <laughs> okay. 10, 50. Okay. And more than 50. All right. Well. Nice. We clearly have some decline to state. But that's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank All you right. very much. Um, so now you have you have the CEO and uh, and, uh, and and one one question that I you know have always asked myself and I guess a lot of companies have themselves is um is uh when do you hire for a sales rep and uh, and what's the profile of that person? Um, well let's let's chat about this, um, but let's also use Algolia as a case study because I think because I think it's an interesting one with with you as the case study. Um, uh, generally. 
I think the rough rule, which I think Algolia did follow, is the biggest mistake founders make, and I know we don't have too many that are pre-revenue, so I'll, so I'll keep it short, but the biggest mistake folks make when it's early is they hire salespeople to get them sales. That, that's the biggest mistake. If, as a founder, you can't find a way to get customers, at least 10 customers, 15, 20 in the early days yourself, it's, it's hopeless. Hiring some VP of sales that you found off uh, AngelList or whatever the French, what's the French version of AngelList? Or where, would you, where do you find a VP of sales magically in Paris? Uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, LinkedIn, okay. It ain't gonna work. It ain't, who, who, you can't conjure sales out of nowhere. Um, and let's talk about that and let's go back in time. And I've written, a, I've written probably the, about this a thousand times, but maybe obliquely. A VP of sales, all she or he will do is improve what works a little bit. If you don't have the tiniest engine going, if, you're, if you haven't closed 10 customers, 20 customers, 30 customers, you're, we're gonna, I know we're gonna talk about first rules, you are not ready for a VP of sales. What a VP of sales does is come in and hire more good people closes leads faster, closes leads better, adds urgency to your sales process. L ask for 20K when you're only comfortable asking for 10K. Ask for a million when you've only asked for 100K. But I don't know any VP of, of sales, like a traditional experienced one who will, that's any good that will join something without an already a bit of an engine working. So that's the VP of sales thing. The same is kind of true for, for a sales rep. Um, now, uh, if, if you expect someone you found out of, again, off the, the ether to go get you 10 customers when as a founder you can't get the first 10, it's hopeless. So simple answer is after 10, close 10 yourself. Learn the mistakes, screw it up, get the script right, um, figure out what works, and when you've closed 10, hire a, someone to help you in sales the minute you get to 11. Because getting from 11 to 100 is way too complicated. There's way too many moving pieces, too many conversations, too many demos. Um, the only hack I would say is, and you didn't do this, but, but Algolia kind of got a two for one with you, I would say, um, because you could sell and Nicholas could sell, but if you're truly atrocious at sales and you've tried everything and you, you believe your product is great, try to hire what I call a business development person, someone that can do a little bit more than that, isn't just a sales rep, that can internalize their product, evangelize it, get out there, do what you should be doing as CEO. And I think Algoy had a superpower because it had both of you, right? And you, you were able to, in the very, you were the only revenue professional for a while in the very beginning, right? But you were able to wear two hats, at least in the early days, right? Maybe you can probably tell me three or seven or 10. But you were able to not only do sales, but be this strategic business development guy and think about the next layer and develop some processes yourself. Um, but one way or another, you got to get the first 10. Yeah. One thing that we saw um, at Algolia is that it's, um, we've hired too early someone that was coming from a very structured sales environment um, who, who had a, an entire organization surrounding him and with BDRs, with marketing collaterals, with like, and, and their job is to be expert at one thing, which is selling. Uh, they have never built skills that is not sales related, and they're, some, some of them are not comfortable in those kind of environments. Um, so at least for us, and I, what I see is being successful, successful at other organizations is you literally hire people who are extremely comfortable doing stuff that they're not supposed to do, um, like going out of their comfort zone, or like they're like four by four wheel drive. They will go anywhere and do anything to get things done. Um, and those people are not necessarily the ones that would be coming from a uh, sales force, or they could be, but not necessarily. Uh, it's not because someone has closed 1.5 million in a year that it would be the right person, the right first person in, on your sales team. Yeah, and let me add just one trick I've kind of, you asked what's the profile. Um, let me do a couple things, but then share the one trick, and I've talked about it, but it's a mistake that everyone makes. So what's the right profile? First of all, when you go to hire your first salespeople, they have to have done it has to be sort of, if you're SaaS, they have to have done SaaS. And if you're more developer focused, it would really be nice if they sold to some sort of vaguely technical buyer. It doesn't have to be B2D or API, but it sure would be nice because people can wilt selling to engineers or product people if they've only yeah. sold business software. So, but, so SaaS or B2D, and then two, your, your ACV. So if you're selling a $1,000 a month product, um, and you hire someone that's done a hundred dollar a month product, they're going to fail because they're going to be too transactional. Hundred dollars a month. If your product's a thousand dollars a month, and you hire someone that sold a twenty thousand dollar a month product, she may be very eloquent because that's necessary for a big deal, but they won't be able to do a thousand dollar dealer. So control for the ACV. And then we could say, of course, don't hire folks from Salesforce and Oracle and big companies. You sort of know that, um, but I've I found a way to distill that into one even simpler criterion. 
um, which is, in the early days, this is only true for the first five to six reps, but as a founder, do not hire a rep you wouldn't buy from. This is the mistake you make again and again. It's not just that you hire someone from Box or S Salesforce or Oracle, and you kind of you over-index on the resume and the fancy talk. And yes, they have a huge support network and they have a brand and all this thing stuff means they're going to fail at your, fail at your startup. But it's actually worse than that. You hire them and your gut doesn't say you'd buy from them. You, 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 the buzzwords sound good: the ACV, MRR, CAC ratio, net net revenue retention. Like they they can talk the talk because they learned it at Salesforce or Box. And then you're sitting there and you're like, boy, that that she's really smart or he's smart, but. There's no way at 10K a month they would buy, I, I, I would buy Algolia from her. So you don't have to give them the sell you your pen trick in the first meeting. You don't literally have to say in 60 seconds, you know, sell me your company. Very few people are smart enough to do that. But, but listen and think, and then in the second meeting, do have them sell your product. And, and don't expect that pitch to be perfect. It's okay if it's raw. You're early. It does not have to be super polished. There does not have to be a three-piece suit and a tie. But after five minutes, you have to ask yourself, you have to say, yes, I, will, I have six leads a month. I will trust Gaetan, I will trust Linda, I will trust Bob with those six leads because otherwise these precious leads you, you will, will just be flushed down the drain. And that's where I see startups that, that time and time again what I see happen is they get to 10, 15, 20, 30, 40K and even MRR and then sales drops when they hire their reps. And there's always only one common thread. I ask them, okay, but would you have bought from Eric? And they're like, no, I, I, I like Eric. Right. <laughs> and as founders, we have this super EQ. Even if we're introverts, we know because we, we did the first 10 customers ourselves and we know how hard it is to evangelize and talk. And I know I'm, I'm rambling, but this is the most important thing. Don't hire that person. Do not hire the rep that you wouldn't buy from. Hire one at the end, even if you're going to make other compromises, right. even if they did come from Oracle. Mm -hmm. Like it never worked. It joined Oracle at $40 billion in revenue. But if after that second meeting you're like, she is so passionate about my product, smart enough, she gets it, I believe the pitch that I will hand her my big lead, then, then you're going to make right. it. Uh, so we have one question over here. Yeah, yeah don't it, throw it, it too it is. It's a catch book, so you, you guys have to catch it. <laughs> Luckily, liability is much, <laughs> much lower in France than in the States. Yeah. Yeah. So, but my question, do you really need a sales rep? Like an example of Atlassian, they don't have any sales rep at all. Boy, we'd all, we'd all love to be Atlassian, wouldn't we? We'd all love to be Drew Houston where Sequoia invests and Sequoia says, you need to hire a sales team. He brings in a seasoned guy from Salesforce who builds cubes and puts in processes and after three months he just kicks them out and said, we're minting cash. Why do we need salespeople? <laughs> that would be great. Um, but a couple things. First of all, Atlassian, and you can see, um, I did three different, I've done something with Atlassian every year at the Sastra Annual. I did um, Jay Simons, who's the president who's in charge of sales two years ago. Uh, we had Michael Cannon Brooks this year and they'll both tell you they did a ton of sales at Atlassian. Now what Atlassian did was, um, and there are companies that do no sales at all. But what Atlassian did, which most of us can't do, is actually even fairly early, Atlassian had a large enterprise sales force, but they outsourced it. Okay, they built service providers, particularly based in Australia, but then worldwide, who were on commissions, who were salespeople just like you think, but they were not on the payroll of Atlassian. And usually that doesn't work well because your own people know your product better than any outsourced force. But I, and I don't know why it worked so well at Atlassian. It may be because for a long time they had very unique products. Folks had already exposed to the brand. They already knew that they wanted whatever it was, Jira and other products. I don't know the details, but everyone, if you listen to any of those talks, they'll tell you Atlassian had a huge sales force. It's just not in-house. So, so bear in mind that some of these stories are apocryphal. Um, but do you need a sales team? I mean, uh, maybe not. I mean, it's just beware that freemium is the failed founder's dream. Okay, everyone thinks, here's the last thing about freemium, and whether it's a business freemium or an open API, just remember, free is not a marketing strategy. It, it is not. It may be later when you're big, but it's very, very rare, especially in B2D and B2B, where free alone will get you 10 million, 10 trillion users. It's not enough. And for most of the products we're working on, people are happy to pay. They just want insane value. And making something freer than Algoli or freer than free isn't, isn't a marketing strategy. So um, by all means, try to get there without sales reps. <laughs> just bear in mind you may need them. And, and if you're trying to go up market, uh, I'm not sure you'll find a lot of companies that will sell service, put 100K on the table. 
uh, there's, there's a lot more complexity than you know just buying a thing. Um, that's what we see every day. It's a up constant uphill battle with the CFO, with the legal. There's like you need those people to do that work um, in order to close the deal. A flip, uh, and a flip side, just thinking through the Dropbox from the early days, thinking back on that uh, when I had some visibility. If you can really scale and you a paid product without a sales team, you'll know it. You'll be like Drew Houston. You'll be like, I don't need these these guys around. Like, I mean, <laughs> I'm making half a million dollars a month in free cash flow. What do I need? What do I need all these Salesforce people around? You'll know it. It won't be ambiguous because either freemium. One of the things will happen: your freemium thing will fail. Like, it just won't work because it's not a marketing strategy. Or it will be probably what would have happened with Algoli is it will work, but it won't be enough. Like that segment will work, and Algoli has an amazing long tail, thousands and thousands of small customers. But you'll squint and you'll say, I want to be bigger than that, right? I want to do bigger deals. I don't just want to do that. That that's probably a, the most common scenario. Or you'll be this, you'll it'll all work. <laughs> you'll be overwhelmed, and that third one only really works if one or another you have some insane viral loop. You have to have this insane thing. And Dropbox didn't even know in the beginning they would be viral and they became viral. But most of us are, are, have a low viral coefficient. We are viral and there's that little Algolia thing on the Saster search box and there's this other thing. But it, it, Algolia isn't viral in a matter of hours or days, is it? It's probably vi viral in a matter of many months, mm -hmm. right? Eight, eight, eight or nine months. And so you, it, sales gives that a boost, but you'll know it. Hi, Jason. My name is Gregory. Uh, so you're talking here about sales rep. I guess you mean hunting new logos, right? So what about customer success or account management? What is the threshold? Is it 10 customers, 20 customers? When should you hire customer success? Customer success or, or account management or whatever you call well, it. I think, I think, and I, I'd love to hear what Gaten's learned from Algoli. I think what we all learned as veterans, right? And, and Gaten's even more of a veteran in some ways than I am, is we all wished we had more customer success folks early. We all learned that you want to smother your early customers with love. Yeah. like. And uh, eventually you have to align around something like a million or more in coverage per CSM because it's too expensive. Because you can't pay them 20 or 30% of the renewal rate like you pay a sales rep, uh, you'll go out of business. You have to pay like 5%. So if you think about 5% and a salary, later you have to get to about 2 million per CSM. But if I had any venture capital today, and all the founders like me that are doing their next startup, they're all loading up on CSM. They raise that five to 10 million, and the next hire you make is I want five CSMs. I just want these early logos. Like, I, I, I don't want to lose them because they're so precious. Um, so usually you hire them way too late. Because uh, <laughs> our own story is, uh, you know, you start, we started to really you know, make revenue in 2014, and we started closing our larger logos in 2014, 2014, 2015. And what we didn't anticipate is that people change jobs, and um, and when you <coughs> don't, when you haven't built a strong relationship with uh, with the team or with the account, typically when people change jobs, they're replaced by someone else whose job is to do things differently. The deal's that immediately at risk, and right? The customers right. immediately they, they at risk. They come in, they have six months to or less to prove themselves, and they they they'll look at anything that they can change or do differently. And if you don't have a relationship with them, they replace the they don't renew. That's, uh, and, and it's, it, that us actually, that's how it happened. So the first churns, you know, we're super proud to have zero churn, but I remember like you and all the people telling us, yeah, that's gonna happen, don't worry. And it did, ha it did happen. And we, so we hired our first customer success uh, manager end of 2016, and we were at the time uh, around four, um, around four million, Nico? No, 10, no, seven million. Seven million in, uh, in annual recurring. Yeah, and, and us, we, we are yeah, not that's a, just not That's just about 6.8 million too late, that's all. <coughs> and today, right? Oh my God, I've, I've had so many conversations with, uh, with Jason about, oh my God, you don't have like, we're, you are, you're late on hiring customer success, you should have heard 20 more. And uh, so today our customer success, they manage each uh, a, a portfolio of about 2 million, between 2 and 3 million each. That's roughly between 20 and 30 accounts, it's probably too much, um, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think 20 or 30 you can get to know and visit. Um, you, you, you know, it's too many to have a strategic relationship with them though, right? It, it's at the edge of reactive. And that's one thing that we're actually starting to see because we start to have really large logos that don't get uh, anywhere near uh, you know, the right amount of attention that they should get. It ends up being like five. Like, like I, had, I wrote this post a long, it took me a while to figure this out, the, the badge rule. But the, this customer success, later, the customer success folks that manage the big accounts, you want them to get five badges. 
Like they're at Algolia so often that they have Algolia gives them a badge because they just can't stand to check them in a long time. And it sounds silly, but if it only works with bigger customers. Bigger customers will give you a badge. Google down the street. If you're there three times a month, the last thing they want to do is check. It's exhausting, right? So if if you're if someone is managing big accounts for you and in 90 days they don't have a badge, in all seriousness, something's wrong. They're not getting on planes. They're not getting, you can't do big deals sitting in front of a computer all day. You have to go there, and you'll get a badge. Like, you'll, you'll, you'll get a badge, they'll get a badge. And, and another thing, another amazing Give them a bonus each time they get a badge. Like, pay them $1,000 <laughs> for every badge they get for a customer. You think I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding. Another great upside of having a strong CS team is that uh, very quickly you realize that a, a large part of your revenue is coming from upsells, cross-sells, and expansion, and those dollars are actually quite cheap to close. Uh, so you just invest in a relationship, and then you harvest um, from it. So the other the, the other thing we've learned that that so we've all learned to do it much earlier, right? We'd all do lay in more. We'd all th there's always a conflict between dollars and time. But everyone, even the most sales driven leader, revenue leaders, would all say, "I take a few more customer success folks early because that's where I can harvest harvest the revenue." Um, sorry, keep going. Yep. Um, any other questions on CS? Yeah. Oh, sorry. One quick point I wanted to make. The other thing that we learned that you can, the other hack, if it's early, not even early, but early-ish, the beauty to customer success early in those nuances is it's, it's the last bastion of the generalist. So, of course, you'd like the perfect customer success professional. But if, you, if, you're, if you're getting going and you've got some revenue, I would rather hire someone I really like a lot that's personable, that has some customer success experience, even if it's not perfect, even if it's not in... Software, like it has to be in technology, okay? It can't, it can't be at the crepery down the street. It's not gonna work. But you can, you know, we, as, we, as everything has gotten richer and more sophisticated, the, 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 we need, you know, sales has become specialized. You can't do, you know, people aren't doing everything themselves. We have BDRs to SDRs to, to AEs to, to account management. Like everything's become hyper-specialized. But customer success, at least in the early days, we can get away with it. I'd much rather have a generalist uh, in the early days. And then later when you have a team of 10, you can get specialized. Thank you. Uh, it's more an advice. Um, when you launch your product, uh, I'm a giant tech product in, in Paris, um, if you think about uh, the um, lead generation uh, and you have two choices when you are self representative, is to take time with like 10, uh, 10 leads or uh, trying to um, generate like 100 leads and, and try to treat, treat them. I don't know sometimes if I have to spend time with 10 clients and have the more uh, customer success are trying to reach like uh, 1,000 uh, prospects and try to do something. I don't know if it's clear. But it's like clear. Should you spend more time on fewer prospects where you can be hands-on or should you be more of a growth hacker and try and get in front of thousands of folks? That, <coughs> that's the question. Ex exactly. Well, the answer, because I, 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 Algoli has been through it, so Gayton will tell you his learnings, but I'll tell you what I think. The First of all, the answer is yes. So, in the, er, in, in the early days, unless you're great at something, if you're, if you're great at outbound, go do outbound. If you're, great, if you're naturally a born growth hacker, be a growth hacker, right? What, if you have, but if you're asking the question, that suggests you're not, you're not naturally, you don't naturally have a superpower in either, right? And if you don't, what you have to do is try everything and then see what sticks. Everything's hard in the early days, but something is just a little bit less hard than everything else. So. Uh, in my first startup, uh, I was a good hustler, so I closed six million in revenue my first year, but I'd never done inbound sales. And then, and then that playbook didn't work for me at EchoSign. So I tried everything, nothing worked. I got good at PR and I guess what we call content marketing today. I didn't know what it was. And so then I had to learn inbound, but outbound worked less well. But you gotta try everything. And then, and then this is like the, the the classic sort of slightly annoying Paul Graham advice, it's okay if it's unscalable though. Just lean in on whatever works and then drop the things that, that don't work, even if it's too hard. And so try everything. Go visit five customers and then do some growth hacking and get 500 leads and see if anything works. <laughs> okay. um, uh, what, so we try, from pure album perspective, we tried two things. The first one uh, failed uh, horribly. Uh, we, we tried the, the mass approach. Um, doesn't work. People are like, I've never, I don't know, like, raise your hands if you ever reply to an Alban email. Right. 
Yeah, you got it. I like so high <laughs> first name. <laughs> so if you haven't have never done it, why do you think it will work for you? So it took, took us six months to realize that. Uh, so and then we changed it entirely. We went the complete other way, or we um, hyper personalized everything that we did. So we decided with to uh, over one quarter to focus on thirty accounts, just thirty accounts, and and we dissected each each one of them. We looked at who we were in touch with on the, on the, you know connected with on on LinkedIn. We we uh, leverage your connections. We leverage like there's so many things. We crafted a story that was tailored to the down to the person that we were writing to. Uh, put together a video, and in the end, out of the 30 accounts, we opened 27. And what we learned from that is actually the initial story that we thought made sense didn't make sense. So we learned so much by having, by being super tailored. It worked because we were targeting larger accounts. So if you if you're an SMB company, that may be a little trickier because that's a huge investment. Us, when we target up market, our deals are you know a, a six figures, so we know that we can spend that time. But I, I, if, if I, I don't know the specifics of your business, but the more personalized, the more you'll learn, and the more impactful you'll be in the end. Cool. Anything else? <laughs> All right. Second question. <laughs> so yeah. um, about the VPO set, so you touched it, uh, you touched on it a little bit. Um, I, actually, there's two questions behind the question. So first question is, when do you think you should hire your VPO sales? Yes. And this, and right, that's <laughs> the second question is VPs of sales, right? Because like between zero and one, one and 10, 10, 20, 20, 50, what are the different characteristics that you're looking at the different stages of, of the company? And what are those moments where they're like, turn like really key moments in the life of the organization where you need to have the person either step up or look for someone different? Well, let's, let's not go through all the stages because we'll diminish the value to the audience and certainly exceed my skill set. But let, let's simplify when you should hire a VP of sales. It's not, again, as we talked about before, before you have any customers. We can agree on that, right? Uh, a traditional VP of sales, uh, there are really a couple alignment points. One is you have to have two reps that are hitting quota. Because what a, the number one thing a VP of sales is, is does is a recruiter. The best VPs of sales just recruit, recruit, recruit. They spend half their time recruiting. And their job then is once you have two reps hitting quota, to get you 10. And they're just going to recruit reps 3 to 10. And if you don't have two reps hitting quota, the hire might work out. But I can tell you it's hyper, hyper risky. So two reps. If you back into the math, typically, for a lightly funded or bootstrap startup, that's probably going to be a million bucks in ARR. It's, it might be, you might have gotten three or four reps, maybe, but those two are going to kind of normalize across each other. You're going to get, you're going to kindly, after making a whole bunch of mistakes, you're going to get two reps that hit quota by around a million. Um, so that's when you want to hire her um, with one very, very important nuance. Super important. It, it's worth saying again and again. This is, a, this is the position that takes the most time to recruit of all the VPs you're gonna hire. And, and the reason is subtle but important. Anyone good you're gonna hire, and, and I wanna make sure we talk about at least one thing, they're almost always gonna be a stretch hire because you have two choices. You're either gonna hire someone that didn't do it or washed out, but they have the VP on their title, or they're gonna be a stretch. That's why they're gonna join you. Um, and um, uh, and so, uh, sorry, I got a little bit distracted because I want to make sure, what was the point I was making before? Usually I don't get distracted. Uh, the two and the million. Um, uh, oh, I've, I forgot the point, so it wasn't that important. Apologies, rare for me. So, uh, two reps and a million, they're gonna be a recruiter. Um, and then yes, these two, oh, oh why it's gonna take a long time. That ties the two things. If you're, especially, if you're gonna hire someone that's a stretch, or maybe someone that's perfect, like this perfect person that doesn't exist, they will likely already have a decent job, okay? A stretch candidate is a director of sales somewhere here or somewhere, and they want a shot at being a VP, or a senior manager that wants a shot at being a head of sales. Um, those, that person usually wasn't fired two weeks ago and has nothing to do. It does happen sometimes, like it happens sometimes. But usually they're doing pretty well, and usually because it's sales, they're making good money already, um, and they have a dialed-in team. So imagine you're a director of sales at a good SaaS or, or B2B company. I'm making $300,000 a year, and I've got a team of seven that I love. Like I'm playing ping pong like when I was here at the day. I like my team. I don't actually love my company anymore, or the CEO's kind of a jerk, or the CRO, I don't like her, or whatever it is. Like Obviously, they're poachable because it's not perfect, but they're making good money, hitting quota all the time, and they love their team. So 
She leaves and comes to your startup. All of a sudden, they got to start working back up to get their bonus. You can give them a draw, but it's not the same, right? They're, they're making them make half their, their guaranteed salary the, the day they walk in. Um, and at best, they're going to be able to take two of those seven with them. They're, you're going to get sued. You're going to get in trouble. Some of those folks are going to stay. So, oh my God, I got to recruit a team again, and I got to make half the money until I get into bonus. Who wants to do that? Now, startup people will do it. You'll, you can give them more equity. You can give them the opportunity. You can give them the title. But assume that takes more than a week. <laughs> assume it takes more than two cafe au lait's. And the best ones do have to be wined and dined. It takes a long time. Um, I invested at a company that just, I just got an email, they just crossed six million ARR. They're late to hire the VP of sales. I know the person that's gonna join. I already know this person's gonna join. Um, and, and this person just went from a VP of sales role to a VP of EMEA and just moved to Europe. And it's gonna take three months for him to decide he's ready to come back to the barrier. And you can't accelerate that process, can you? Making a ton of money, great team. And so my point is, in a perfect world, you got to start interviewing people at half a million in revenue so that you can perfectly make the timing at a million. And that's for the most prescient of you with tons of free time and nothing to do and somehow able to meet all the candidates. So you're going to be late. <laughs> you're going to be late and scrambling after a million. At least know it when it comes. And then budget more time and meet everyone on planet Earth you possibly can. What would be the top three criteria that you would be looking for that you would qualify that would help you qualify VP of sales as a good candidate? Is it like selling to the same audience, hit a high nope. number? No. Nope. So, so, <laughs> so what are uh, <laughs> two? Th if 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 you let's just control for two criteria, and this will screen out ninety five percent of the candidates you meet anyway. Okay, for for stretch candidates, Let, we can talk about washed out candidates next, like the perfect LinkedIn who you don't want to hire because why would they be interviewing with you? Um, they might want to interview at uh, something like Algolia today, but knowing what the perfect LinkedIn wants to join anything earlier than 250 employees. It's too much work to do this. It's too, we, it's, how hard has it been? I mean, it's been great, but it's hard, right? Why would anyone electively want to get here where I can just walk into this beautiful office, uh, have a great, great everything waiting for me? That's, that's the smart time to join. Um, so, sorry, the question again was? I'm usually pretty curious. Cri oh, criteria. So, so two things for your stretch can, because this is the mistake you'll make. The first one, you just have to do your diligence. They have to have hired, hired two sales reps that hit quota. And that, this may sound simple, but it's not. Many of the stretch candidates you will meet worked on great teams, inherited teams, sort of recruited people, but it was really my boss that recruited them, right? It was really the VP of sales or the CRO that brought them in. And they inherited a team. Those folks do not know how to recruit. They don't. They may know how to lead, and they may know the cadences, and that those are important. But the number one job for VP of sales, sales is recruiting, 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 and then backfilling, and then all the other stuff. Recruiting and backfilling. And if they, ha you don't want to take this risk. Just when you finally have two great reps, you don't want to hire a boss from them that's never figured out how to get two reps in quota carrying capacity. So, you can take a risk from three to three hundred. You can take a risk that if all they've ever done is hired two great reps, um, you can take the risk that because if you've learned two you'll find a way to hire three, four, or five, but never do this. These ones never work out. There are exceptions, but the only exceptions are when they join super early, like almost pre-revenue, so they're there so long in the early days. They were your first rep, it can work. Um, and I know you'll all make this mistake. You'll meet this super charismatic AE that you'll try to lure out of Algolia, and she'll be great, um, but never really hired people, um, and they all, they all, trust, trust me, they always fail. And do the work, ask them. Ask them who the two they hired, and then go talk to the two. Did Bob, did Linda recruit you? How did she find you? How did she recruit you? And if that story falls apart, like walk out of the door. Okay. Second one is that person has to have mostly sold at your target ACV. If you're out, and this is your, and they're average. Algolia's got a logarithmic or long distribution of different customers. You've got free and $10 a month to six figures to seven figures. But whatever the role is going to be, and, and ideally where it's going to be in like six months, because maybe you're driving at market. But if you want your average ordinary deal to be, say, 20K a year on December 31st, hire someone that's done 20K deals. Because that will control for almost everything else. That will control for type of product, cadence, number of leads you need, ratio of outbound to inbound. If they've done a $20 a month product and somehow done it with sales, they ain't no outbound at $20 or $100 a month. It's thousands and thousands of leads a month. And if they've done six-figure deals, it's field sales. They're out there generating their own pipeline. They're out, they're not overloaded with leads, right? They're out there hitting it. 
And if it's 20K, it's somewhere in the middle. It's probably going to be a, a measured amount of leads per month that's mostly from inbound with process. So that's the mistake you'll make. You love, you love this person, but they came out of Dropbox and they came out of the SMB group. And that, that's probably nothing like your product. So screen out for the wrong ACV and screen out for having hired two reps. If, if they're at your ACV and they've hired two reps and you love them, just hire them. J just hire them if you love them. Any questions on that? Clear? All right, there's another role that is super important in the startup because we keep talking about sales, but we don't sell if we don't get leads. Oh. Yes. Same question, like when do you hire VP of marketing or CMO and, and, and what does this person look like? And sa same questions. Well, let, let's, let's, let's talk for a, f a, f a minute about the distinction between VP of marketing and CMO because never has the distinction been right. so great as it has evolved the last couple of years. Um, but I, I, one of the early posts I wrote on Sastra, because it took me a while to figure this out, and, it, and I've learned that's true with every of the 25 startups I've worked with and invested in since, um, 20K in MRR, 20K a month is when you should hire a head of marketing. Not someone to write blog posts, not someone to work on your tweets, not someone that, ha I'm talking about a head of marketing. And, and let me define what head of marketing means and let me tell you why 20K a month is the right amount. A head of marketing is someone that has held a commit. It could be a lead commit, it could be an opportunity commit, it could be a revenue commit, but somewhere from the top of the funnel to the bottom, they've held a number. 90% of marketers have never held a number. Um, some of them have never held a market number because they've been in corporate marketing or product marketing, which are abstracted from, they're important later. I mean, Algolia at this scale with its brand needs all those folks. It needs corporate marketers and product marketers and uh, upside down left marketers, right marketers, US marketers, EMEA marketers. But in the early days, you don't need someone working on uh, your, your, your branding. That, that's a couple hours of work. You need demand gen, you need leads. Um, so find someone that's held a number uh, at their prior job. and. One, sorry, there's two reasons they haven't. One is because they've done, they haven't done demand gen. They've done corporate or product marketing. The other reason is what tends to happen, and this doesn't happen in sales, everyone in sales holds a number, right? Even if you're an SGR, you might at least have an appointment. You've got some number in the funnel. But me, most marketers, even that say demand gen on their resume, they've supported someone with a number, but they did not have to hold a number. They were not responsible if the number was missed each quarter. So you have to hire someone that's at least senior enough it doesn't have to be a CMO. You don't want a CMO, but at least senior enough to have hold the number. Just ask, what number did you hit? And then ask them, when did they not hit it and why? And you should hear a very honest answer because there's many reasons marketers won't hit their number. Uh, they lost their budget. Um, the goals changed. The metric changed. You want to hear a couple tough stories about why they missed their number and not just met it, and then you know, then you know you've got someone that can hold the number for you and that you will accelerate. And so when you have someone like that, Worst case, you're going to get like 20% more leads, or even if you get no more leads, you're going to get 20% more productivity from your funnel. Best case, you'll double. Even if you don't get any more leads, if she or he just puts in drip marketing, reaches out to more people, communicates better, manages the leads to the sales force, you can double 50% or 100% the revenue on, on your own. So let's say you're at 20K a month in revenue, and you want to be 100K at the end of the year, right? That's plus, that's plus 80K. And you get another 20, 30, 40% out of that person. And so you end the year at 120, 130, 140 instead of 100. She's paid for herself, right? It's completely accretive. So think about what the goals are to increase those leads or increase the funnel. This will be an accretive hire at 20K in MR. This is not obvious. Everyone waits too long. They think it's an expensive hire and they don't they get it's accretive. Get me more leads or increase the revenue per lead. You pay for yourself over the next six to eight months. So what's the CMO then? Okay, now, now, so now what everyone, okay, so let's talk about a fundamental change the last four years. So there, what we have now, what has changed is, is it may not feel this way in Paris, but certainly in the Bay Area, we are finally overloaded with veterans. When I started in 2005, 2006, I couldn't find any veterans. My VP of sales came from LinkedIn. The first one was from Salesforce. We, we can talk about that later. But the one that worked out was from LinkedIn. That was a blessing. But LinkedIn was still a scrappy startup back then. There weren't, there weren't that many. There weren't all these SaaS startups. And we've had 15 B2B IPOs already this year. And those teams are gonna, they're gonna have turnover over 10 years. And those turnovers are gonna create, they're gonna seed the next level of management. And there's the cloud has grown so much just the last four years that finally veterans, veterans are out there. And so that's the good side. You can find people. And, and uh, we had our speaker dinner for the Saster Annual 
uh, Sastra Europa last week. At, at Thursday night, I had at my table was the president of Zora, which just IPO'd, and the CMO of Anaplan, which will which is crushing it. They'll IPO in the next 12 months. And they're SaaS veterans. They've both been doing this in B2B software their whole careers. And both of them said, three to four years ago, for the European offices, they couldn't find anyone senior, anyone good. And now they said they're, they're, they love all the talent. They love their, their, their European offices are outperforming the US. Now, they may not find the C-level people, but but the directors and the managers, they, they, they're, they're, they're happy. That's, that's this sort of growth of, of cloud and SaaS and B2B has created, created more managers. So that's all wonderful. The downside is today everyone wants to be a CRO or a CMO. <laughs> so everyone that wanted to stretch to VP of sales four years ago, they're all asking for CRO and CMO titles. And this is fraught with peril. Um, you absolutely need both as you scale. Uh, and CROs didn't even exist for real four or five months ago or they were glamour titles. But when you think about the life cycle of a customer from sales development and outbound, to closing, to upsell, to renewal, when you're on a 10-year journey of a customer, a VP of sales can't own all of that. It's overwhelming. They own, as, as, even though it's one of my favorite roles in support, it's a moment in time on a 10-year journey. So for that reason alone, we've all realized we need some sort of CRO as these recurring revenue businesses scale because it's too complicated. Uh, so that we've learned. And then as we've gotten more sophisticated in marketing, we're building bigger teams and we need, we need demand gen and corporate marketing and product marketing. We need a leader to manage this. And that's great at say 20 million error. <laughs> Maybe 10 million if you're growing quickly or funded, but be very wary of those titles before then because you can't meet those expectations. There's too much going on, there's too many fiefdoms. And, and the bigger risk is people flame out. You have folks that have been director of demand gen that want to be CMO. They can't, they can't live up to that. You have folks that have been a director of sales that want to be your CRO and own outbound SDR, BDR, um, selling, a customer, and they've never even managed customer success. They want it. These are burnout roles. So that's a, that's a stretch risk today, and it just as founders, it's tough to manage. But my learning is today, if you can, let people stretch one role, one level up. That, that's, that's, that's the commitment you make to joining a startup as a manager. Like, let people grow. If you are a director, let them be a VP. If they're a manager, let them be a director. Or find a way they can get there quickly. But if they stretch two levels, the, the odds of success are very, very low today. That, that's a risk, that a mistake I've made. And, and I see it so many more. Don't make that mistake. Um. Maybe one, so one last question that I'll ask, I'll ask you, and then I would love you folks to uh, take the mic. Um, so we, us, we started in San Francisco, in yes. the US market. I know that you've invested in all But I think there was a brief uh, stop in New York, uh, wasn't like, there? It was like a three-day layover, maybe. Oh, three-day layover, <laughs> okay. <laughs> maybe I'm missing it, right. um, uh, You've invested in, in France. Yeah. Uh, you're getting more and more interested in European companies. How do you think they should think about New York versus San Francisco? Well, I, I think... <coughs> or, um, other, or other regions. Yeah, case. I've done five French companies, Portugal, Takdes, two Swedish, British, uh, Armenian. Um, I, um, so I, like most things, I have a slightly more nuanced view than I had, four, say, four years ago because of talent pools. Um, I, I would say four years ago, it was a 100% mistake to go to New York. Uh, and there are exceptions like... But, but, uh, but every... We, you know, we just we just had this CEO confidential panel with a bunch of CEOs past 20 million last week at Europa, and they all they all talked about their briefs. Many of them, including like uh, PJ from Showpad, their brief stop in New York. And New York, for most of you, is is the, is the worst combination of all. Um, you get some of. The, I mean, the t I'm still jet lagged. I mean, boy, the time zone to the barrier, it's brutal, isn't it? it it's brutal. And New York is not a little bit better. It's like 5,000 times better to to Europe, isn't it? it it's so much better. But, but you, don't, you don't get the ecosystem, you don't get all the tech leaders, you don't get the sales forces and the Googles and the Facebooks and, and, and everything that's happening out there. Because yes, uh, unicorns are more distributed globally, but even more of them are in the Bay Area. So you, you lose that concentration. And there just isn't the same bench for the VP talent. So it's not worth it for the time zone benefits. And uh, Yes, are, are there more B2B and B2D veterans in New York than there were three or four years? Absolutely. So I think, I think you can make it work. But I can tell you the companies I'm involved with in New York are, struggle more with executive talent than San Francisco. And San Francisco is terrible in 2018. It's awful. It's brutally competitive. Everyone quits after three days. 
everyone's a mercenary. Everyone wants to be a CRO or a CMO after three days as being an SDR. It's really the worst ever. I mean, it's the worst in my life. San Francisco is just terrible. Like, rents have doubled in a year. Like, do not go to San Francisco unless you have a reason to go to San Francisco. But the flip side is there's a reason, which is that even as these other ecosystems have grown, um, the competitive advantage of San Francisco grows even more because every, it's like SaaS, everything compounds. So the fact that you can walk, literally, that's why I built a 20,000 square foot office in San Francisco that, that all these European startups can work at part time as they come. It's called the co-selling space because those advantages are, are bigger than ever. Um, so, you know, it's tough. Uh, if, but, if you, but the flip side is, my more nuanced view is, if you sell to SMBs, if you're low end, uh, be Shopify. Stay in, don't, don't come, right? You don't, Shopify did not need to come to the US. Atlassian is huge in the barrier, but they came late. They came late. Um, and there are more, there are more great web savvy college graduates you can hire in any city smaller than Paris. So why come, I don't know if you should come to San Francisco if you don't need the partners and you can sell to SMBs. Uh, but for enterprise, don't stop in New York. Don't just go, go big or go home or stay home, I think. So uh, about the competition right now, um, we've entered the world of uh, SDRs or BDRs that cost more than $100,000 a year. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, doubled. I think everything's doubled in the last four years, yeah. especially when you count in employee churn and turnover and rent. I think it's sales professionals in the Bay Area, the cost has doubled in the last four years. Yeah. Um, and and they right. don't really want to hit their quotas, do they? They want to be paid that, uh, <laughs> but they want it guaranteed. And uh, they want it all handed it to them it's, with a it's, nice uh, clean desk. It's, it's a very different way of managing people uh, yeah, compared very. compared to Europe and uh, and even what you see in the other cities. And it's tough. And the, the other tough thing in San Francisco, it's tough culturally. Is and I don't mean to be to 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 have stereotypes, but I would say, and I live there, and I invest a lot of time. I would say. The, the flip side of the bear is people are the least grateful of any time I've been. That they, employees are just not grateful. And, and as founders, that's our job is to, they don't need to be grateful. We should be grateful to employees. We're lucky that everyone, everyone that's ever worked for us, we should be grateful for them. We should be grateful they took a risk and a bet on us. We, but, but it'd be nice to get like 5% grateful back. <laughs> it'd be nice to have at least, because I view my, and I, I find myself a worse CEO than I've been in the past because my playbook doesn't work. My playbook as CEO myself has been empower people. Give them the highest role, the most, let them run with it. Don't be critical. Let them make mistakes. Emp empower people that haven't been empowered before. Take away bureaucracy. Take away criticism. Take away politics. Be grateful. Thank everybody all the time. And that's usually worked for me. It's failing for me in 2018 the Bay Area because no one appreciates anything. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that's, uh, uh, but, but if, you, if you can be there, be there. Just It's, it's harder than ever to, to thrive there. All right, I will say having invested in whatever, six French startups, that have that all have challenges and have localization issues and even you know language issues. They're all glad they came to San Francisco. A hundred percent of it. as hard as it is, even with rents, even working in crazy offices, they're all they're all they all a hundred percent sure. That, you know, it's a it's a self-selecting group, but none of them would say don't do it. They would all say do it. All right, questions from the floor. Who wants to start? Oh. <laughs> Got it. Uh, on that topic, if you think you need to go to the Bay Area, when would be a good time to go? Uh, well, Algolia started at 12K a month in MRR, roughly, because that's, that's when I met with the team. So it wasn't, it wasn't full time. But, um, but uh, so early. Now, now what, what I learned from Algolia was this idea of, of faking it. So, and I believe in this, and I believe in this. Uh, Nicholas and Gaetan in particular faked it. And, and what do I mean by faking it? Uh, there's, you, the advantage to San Francisco is, the, is, is being able to have a meeting anytime. Like we just moved to a new office, uh, and I have now bumped into Owen McKay from Intercom three times down the street, okay? I bump into everybody. We're, we're around the block from Intercom, so you might see him too. I bump into everybody near South Park, and I mean, it's almost too much, but, it, but it's fun. Uh, and if Salesforce or someone wants to have a meeting, you just walk down the street. And what I found some companies that aren't in the Bay Area, at least in the beginning, do is they have an illusion. And um, they're, they're, they're there. And I learned this early. There was a company that, that got bought early. It was called Boomi, which was like an early version of MuleSoft that Dell bought for 100 and something million. I knew the CEO. 
And back in the day when I was a CEO, 06, 07, 08, 09, Rick Nucci was a great CEO. He'd be everywhere. I mean, I'd, he'd be at every trade show, every event, connecting these on-prem to the cloud. And, I, and it, was, it was one of my favorites. So it was all, you know, you always have these folks it's fun to bump into because you like them so much. I didn't know for three years he was in Philadelphia. <laughs> And I said, what? what? You're coming? He's like, yeah, I made a commitment to my team and my family that this was a, that we sell 100% to technology companies at, at, at Boomi. And so that no customer or partner would know. Now, not that he lied. He didn't mean it literally. But there would be no, they would not be disadvantaged because I ran the company in Philly. And so he would fly three times a month to the Bay Area, which I don't have the energy to do. And now, although he didn't do that, but you guys were there often enough that you could fake it until you were there. Uh, and we, and we, that works, it just doesn't last forever. And it's exhausting, but it's a way to hack it in the beginning. We especially faked it from here because we, uh, we, we still have uh, air call numbers. You guys know air call, right? So we had uh, uh, 415 numbers, uh, our signature. Everything looked like we were there. Uh, we would take calls at like any time of the night. You know, are you available at 3 p.m. San Francisco? I'm like, yeah, sure, it's midnight here. So you don't turn the cam on and you look, you sound like you're, you're there. The good thing is that people are, um, it's what I've seen in San Francisco, they don't want to see you, they don't need to see you. It's, it's actually, it's an intrusion when you get to really meet with people. Like a lot of the sales process can be done remotely and you just meet them on the key moments where you need, you need to meet them. Um, it worked for us. Thanks. Yeah, you don't get to sleep a lot though, but. <laughs> Anyone, anything else on this point? One last no thing on the yeah. U.S. market for what it's worth, and let's move on. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've started to challenge, you know, I've been doing this, this studying SaaS companies and investing for a while, so I challenge my assumptions. So I've, I, I've started, I, the, this last year, I got on a jet more often myself and visited more, uh, many European back founders that started in other places, Boulder and Colorado, which is beautiful, a bunch of other cities. And um, I will tell you, and again, I'm, I'm stereotyping and oversimplifying, but another advantage, New York's great, but for most other places, there's not enough urgency. Uh, and this peer pressure and being around other founders that are struggling and succeeding, uh, you, you, there's nothing like the barrier for that. There's nothing like hitting a million in revenue, growing 20% a month and feeling like a failure. <laughs> you just don't, you just don't. And I almost, there was this company that I loved. I really liked it. It was, uh, it was in a very distant space to Algolia. And I loved the CEO who's European. He'd come to the US. And he was at a million in revenue, growing about 5 or 6% a month. So he's going to double this year. Um, it's not good enough. You'll, I mean, it's fine, but you will never IPO. You'll never be worth a lot. You'll never be, you'll never be Algolia. And he was happy. He, and I, I, I don't want to be critical. It's, it's, not, it's not my life. But I'm, and he was living this beautiful, bucolic life in Boulder. And I, I, I didn't, I'm never critical. I do Columbo. I do trick questions. You know, how, how do you feel? Is 5%? What's the plan? He's like, yeah, we're on plan. We feel pretty good. And you just don't. There was no, and I'm, I'm simplifying. But as tough as it is in San Francisco, this, this having people around you as founders, it's very valuable. Yeah, so for, for us, friends, I remember uh, very vividly it was at YC when we actually really decided to start that sprint. So you run a marathon at the speed of a sprint. And, the, and kind of the, the, um, uh, the targets that we set for ourselves are, you know, you know the, this double, triple, triple, double yes. thing? So once you hit your first million, you have to triple it uh, over two years. So from one to three to, uh, to nine. And then you have to double it over the next three years. So in the end, in, the, in about uh, the span of four, uh, four or five years, you end up around 40 million in AR. So it's, it's and the thing, you compare yourself with the other companies that are, you know, the New Relic, the Abdi, the LinkedIn, the, and when you look at the sort of the ratios and the growth phase that they've had, no matter the product, they're following the same thing. And that's kind of what defines a lot of the, I guess, the valuation when they go IPO as well. And when you start that race, you're in it. Like, you can't give up, you can't stop. And, and all the ratios that, when you started, didn't make any sense at all. Like, when, you know, we're, right now we're 250 people. Like, last year, year ago, we probably hired 150 people in a year. That's just crazy. But once you start accepting that other people can do it, then you start putting yourself in that motion, and maybe it's possible, and you build a plan and actually realize that it's not, it's not out of reach. It's insane, it takes a lot of energy, but other people did it, so you, if you, you actually decide to play in, a, in this sort of league, um, but it's, yeah, it's, um, it, it can be sometimes demoralizing when you see other folks out there and you compare yourself. It's like, I remember, uh, it was one, uh, one VC who told me, like, when you go to San Francisco, you, it's like moving from 
college basketball to NBA, you know, you, you're, you're starting to really play against like the more, a lot more aggressive people, but it's good because it makes you better. Yes, it may not be fun, but it does make you, it does make you better, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's any other question I would love to have. Oh yeah, go ahead. Well, a question uh, even from your experience, because uh, you said mentioned that you had the technical background and then you moved, you know, to uh, the to technical social. be exaggerating, but keep up well with the well, point. Yes, kind yeah. of. Like, what would be your advice, you know, for technical guys uh, starting a, a company? So, if you had technical background, like really, my advice uh, is to get out of the office. <laughs> is to go meet with customers. Um, and, but, but let me, let me follow that a little bit. Here's what, um, uh, it's the, uh, Michael Cannon Brooks did this talk with Michael Pryor from Trello because he bought him. So I had him interview his boss. It was really fun. You can see it on YouTube. And I didn't know what they're going to talk about. Uh, they talked, he talked about how Michael still thinks he has imposter syndrome, even with at lasting today, that he's not, he's not entirely comfortable that he's a winner or talking to customers. If he has imposter syndrome, of course you're gonna have it too, right? So we all should, we all should feel like imposters going talking to these big customers all the time. But, and I always felt it, but here's, what's, here's a superpower that especially CEOs have. And it took me a long, I didn't figure this out until the, the first time I went to, I, we closed Dell early and I flew out to Round Rock in the middle of Texas and uh, you know we've been doing this for 12 months, and 20 people come to this meeting. I'm like, why? I, I, I'm running an 11 person startup. <laughs> like, why are they coming? But there is magic in those three letters, the CEO. It is magic. Um, and if you're trying to close revenue, you know there's magic to grabbing the CEO and bringing him or her into the meeting, right? Uh, most folks never get to talk to a CEO. And yes, being a CEO of a five or 10 person company does not feel remotely glamorous. It feels like the least glamorous job in the company. But it's magic to customers. It's magic, and it's even magic to other CEOs. But certainly mid-level managers that you're going to selling to. So, don't be scared. Get out there. And if you've never sold before, it's okay, because even if you're terrible at sales as a CEO, you have one superpower, which is you're a good middler. Okay, you may not know how to prospect, and you may not even know how to ask for a check very well. But you can do the best demo anyone can do of your product because you built it. You're the best middler. And in the early days, no one's heard of you. And what they want to know is, can you magically solve the problem? And that demo in the early days, in person, it's so impactful because you walk into the room and you stutter and you're nerdy or you're the founder. They don't care. They care that this magician, this CEO, can do this most amazing demo of this feature-poor, bug-ridden product, but it does something magical. They will buy from you. So you do not have to be the world's best salesperson to sell a CEO, you, but you got to do it. you got to get on a jet, get out of the office, and not sit in front of a screen all day, and you'll be shocked how much the customers love you. They'll all love you. Just be yourself. Hi. Um, if you were to build EchoSign again in yes. this day and age and uh, distribute it through Europe, yes. which city or which market would you choose? Boy, I don't, I don't know if I'm smart enough to answer that question. Um, I will say that... Um, you know, all, all products are global. I, I don't know if I can be helpful, I, but, but the answer would still be London. Um, London is not tax efficient like Ireland is. It's a terrible, economically it's terrible. Um, but what, ha well, what tends to happen with English language products, almost all of them, is you kind of do nothing at all from a marketing perspective and you get like 10% of your revenue in the UK and like 4% in Australia. It's like a gift, okay? If you don't localize your product, it may or may not perform in Germany. It will not perform in Japan. It definitely won't even get through the, the great firewall in China. But you will automatically get British and Australian companies. So if you don't have experience and you don't know what you're doing, your initial European is, is UK still part of Europe? I can't keep up. I think, I think it's so, so it still is for now, right? London, London for your European office and Australia for your EMEA office, even though they may not be where you want to be eventually. Maybe you move to Paris or, or even Berlin, or maybe you move to Dublin because it's cheap. And no, you know, maybe you don't stay in Australia as the head of your EMEA office. But this fact that you'll naturally get, if you're English customers there, just means like you want to start these, these, these international offices where you already have customers. It's just easier because if you don't know what to do with your international customer, make it customer success. Even if you don't know how to do sales yet, if 10% of your revenue is in England, go put some people in, go put some people in England. So I may, be, I, may not, I may be wrong, but I would start where the customers are. 
Yeah, in terms of uh, of, of um, talent pool, you get uh, more. There's um, um, more companies that have already opened offices in in London and they have field reps and mid market reps and all of that that you don't necessarily have uh, in uh, other countries, like in in Paris, for instance. So you also leverage the fact that others have done the job before you, so you can uh, tap into those those pool. Uh, Dublin is extremely competitive now, uh, even for for SDRs, uh, especially for SDRs. What what happens in Dublin is quite similar to what happens in uh, in um, in San Francisco. Um, so usually, so what we do, for instance, mm -hmm. is we poach uh, SDRs from uh, uh, companies that are based in Dublin. Um, they usually do the they usually hire the best people from the best universities in the, in, in Europe. Uh, after a couple of years, those people they hate the weather they realize that the, the growth is actually super slow and their people are extremely hungry because they're coming from the you know, top, top universities. Um, a lot of them wants to move back to their countries. So our sourcing today is specifically targeted towards companies in Dublin that have French people, uh, SDR position, who've been there for a minimum two years because we know that they've reached a level where they want to uh, go away. So. Yeah, Dublin's this weird market just because of tax efficiencies and others where all the U.S. companies right. just flooded in because it, it was just so much more cost efficient right. from an after-tax basis. Anything else? I have, I have one, one last question for you, uh, Jason. I've been thinking the entire day whether or not I should ask it, <laughs> but still. Um, y you guys know who was the biggest competitor to EquiSign, right? Yes. DocuSign. And DocuSign recently went IPO, went public. Today they're worth ten billion dollars. What what advice you know would you give a company? Because you 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 know EcoSign had an amazing product. Uh, Tam was quite equal yep. talents. What was the difference between those two companies? And how do you read that? If you could do things differently today, would you do them any differently? And what advice would you give anyone here to, you know, become like a a, a DocuSign when they're competing against uh, you know other com similar companies? Uh, I think, so, yeah, it, it's some good learnings. There's, there's not only is there a great public comp, but one thing that's clear is, even if I hadn't done a perfect job, I'd still be running a company doing north of 100 million myself today and running it myself. So, it, w ignoring other issues, would I rather be running that company today than doing all the investing and creating disaster? Probably, Pr probably, although CEO's a hard job. It, it, it's very hard. So it's easy to say it now when as hard as what I do now is it's 50 times easier than being a CEO. It, it's really a tough job. And um, But I'm going to get to your question in a minute. There, what I wonder is if, if I was a good enough CEO to keep doing it. I don't know if I was a good enough CEO, uh, but probably. I was probably at the edge of it. So what did I not know at that time that I know now? Uh, I, didn't, um, I didn't have, first of all, I had no good mentors. So I hit... 10 million in revenue, growing almost 100% a year. Cash flow positive, went cash flow positive 4 million, only raised, raised eight, spent five. So that's not easy, right? Uh, had a great team, low churn. No one told me I was doing well. Uh, in fact, I probably heard the opposite from some of my investors and other people. So uh, a lot of localized reason for that, but get, get help, get a mentor. We all, the values of mentors are understated. Uh, a mediocre mentor, a patronizing mentor, a random board member, those are not, those are, those are, those are attraction. But I needed someone a stage or two beyond me that would slap me in the face and say, dude, you're at 10 million in revenue growing 100%. You have these amazing logos. You have the Googles and the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Yelps. Uh, you're doing great, and it doesn't even matter if it took you longer than you anticipated. You're growing 100% at 10 million, you're cash flow positive. This is a gift, and the, the stupidest thing would be to sell your company today. Um, now, you know, I was the largest shareholder, and we had a nine-figure exit, and I had team challenges, and I raised, you know, single-digit millions. So it wasn't, by the standards of 2011, again, remember the, the public markets have grown 700%, it wasn't a terrible deal. Like, it, it wasn't a terrible deal. But it wasn't, but, but no one, no, I needed a better, a, a better mentor. The other thing I, di I didn't, uh, none of us really understood at the time, but now we all know, is that high NPS recurring revenue lasts decades. So I always was worried that I could lose it all in a heartbeat, that, that, that uh, the markets would evolve into more sophisticated versions of the product, that I wasn't good enough, that our team wasn't good enough, that we would miss the moment that something would change. I felt that everything was fragile, especially after the huge downturn of 2008 to 2009. I felt it was too fragile. And that's certainly true, but 
once you cross 10 or 15 million in revenue, if you're growing quickly, if you have net negative churn, if, if even if you have churn, if you're, if you're if, as a corpus, if your customers are adding more revenue each year than they're doing, and, the, and your NPS is north of 40, I have learned that if you have a decent team, you cannot be killed. All of my, all of my companies at the same time, some, I, I probably sold the earliest relative, I probably did the dumbest thing, which had the most rel revenue relative to a relatively early exit. But they all, even weird ones like Smartsheet, which IPO'd this year, I mean, they were started at the same time, and they were in a rocket ship, but they're at 100 and something million in revenue worth a billion something. They all got to that 10 million or above, growing 80, 90, 100, 110% with happy customers, and they just couldn't be stopped. And, and you know what, you know, even if you have scrappy competitors, you know the market so well, you know what the customer needs. Algolia knows everything that thousands of customers need. You're so smart that that's why I call it from impossible inevitable. Just get to that 10 million phase. And no one, no one told me, no, no one told me that I had something good or special on that I could get to 100 million. I thought the risks of 10 to 100 at 100% growth, 120% revenue retention, 40 plus NPS, I thought it was risky, it wasn't risky. It was hard, like it doesn't ever get easier, does it? You, I say, it, you get better, but it doesn't get easier, but I didn't know. So those are the things that sort of nobody told me. And then the third one, which I still struggle with, is the DocuSign example is interesting, but there was only one founder, no founders were left post-IPO, and there's only one real founder who owned less than 1%. So now 1% of 10 billion is a lot of money, okay? Um, and that's more money than I made. But, and he started in 2000. DocuSign actually, it, the website says 2004, but I was there. It started in 2000, it was a different company do, called DocuTouch. So he had to wait almost 20 years and all the risk to get that 1% is, that, is like, and, and so I, I worried about, and this is a niche topic, I over worried about dilution. So we, here's, the, the, here's the meta lesson is anyone that's been around for a while has scar tissue. Uh, maybe some of you don't. My first startup, I sold for 50 million after 12 months, but I had to sell 80% in my seed round. So we went through a, a type of dilution that you don't see these days. And I had scar tissue. And as bad as it was to sell 80% in your first round, what if you did three more rounds? Like, like I would have been diluted to, to, to literally to nothing. So when we had huge, we had six million in our first year, so it wasn't actually a terrible, it was a pretty good deal for our acquirer for 50 million, but it was one year. But when I looked at what these rounds would take in my role and that I would be shrunk to nothing after selling 80% of the first round, I had scar tissue. So the next time I went the other way, right? I, I didn't even sell 10 million of stock. And I said, I'm not going through that again. But, but I didn't see the future well enough. And I turned down 20, 30, 40 million in venture capital at a high price. I should have just taken it. Uh, I should have taken the dilution. And most importantly, and last niche answer, why didn't I take the dilution? There were two reasons. One reason is I didn't want my shares diluted too much. Um, but, but there was really maybe a more important reason than that. I don't know that I really minded the dilution so much. You hire a team, you're gonna get diluted, right? It all, it all it takes a village. I was worried about optionality. And I was worried that when I was offered 20 or 30 million at 100 pre or 150 pre or whatever at that point, or maybe I could have gotten it up even higher, even though it was 2011, I could have gotten a very good price. I read, gosh, I closed this round at 150 million and these jerky VCs want their three to 10X, like I basically have to IPO now. Um, and I wasn't, it wasn't that I didn't want to do it, I wasn't willing to make the commitment so ahead of time and, 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 and like lose my exit options. And people talk about this, and they talk about this more, and all these VCs at SAS Europa last year talked about exit options, and Christoph Jans and I talked about it in the kickoff, like you lose these exit options. How many, there's plenty of amazing IPOs and exits, but how, is, is huge M&A routine in France? It's not, right? Point, point to the, uh, the great $500 million, billion dollar M&A exits in Paris, in B2B. So th these, are, these are fears, and I had a fear. And so when I, when I got a nine-figure offer, I didn't really want to take it. It, it. I almost walked away at the end. I can tell you that story. I almost walked away uh, twice on that deal. But I couldn't see that, I couldn't see that next step. I couldn't see any options between a, a low nine-figure exit in an IPO. And a couple things happen. First of all, the world grows. There's lots of options today. And secondly, I realize it doesn't matter. What I realize is you don't need an exit strategy. You don't need options. The options present themselves. And worst case, if you raise money to 100 million, and which just sounds like a lot, and you decide four years later to sell for 100 million, it's gonna suck. Like your investors are gonna be mad, and it's gonna be a crummy deal, but the world, you'll, it'll work itself out. It's okay, this stuff works itself out. Especially try to get investors that you sort of trust, 
But these things are not as black and white as they sound. And go for it if you have something good. And the options and the optionality will take care of itself. Don't, don't worry about it, as trustful as it is. But I can say that with two exits under my belt, right? Um, but I've learned uh, d throw optionality out the window and just go for it. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for the transparency, Jason. <laughs> Um, so with that, uh, further ado, I think we can uh, wrap up, give a huge round of applause to, uh, to Jason, please. Yeah, thanks to everybody. Yeah. And, and, if you, and if you don't know it yet, go to Saster blog. It's an amazing source of information. Even like the, the old, old, old blog posts, they still learn a ton from it. This plus the conference is also amazing in the, in the US and in Paris. All Thank right, you, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, very good. <clears throat> All right, thanks, everyone.